Got a comment the other day that said, Hey, Joe, you talk about get it right at the source a lot, but when I look on your channel, I see mostly mixing content. Where's the recording content? Fair point. So today, we're going to talk all about four ways to get it right at the source. This video, and especially tip number four, could be a big unlock for you and your music if you're willing to really understand it and really apply what I'm talking about. It's not easy, but it's worth it. The reason talking about getting it right at the source can feel so elusive for a lot of people is it's different every time. Every time I sit down to record guitar, I'm re learning what's the best spot to put the microphone for recording that guitar. I have a good idea, but I'm always open to changing that depending on what it sounds like that day. Recording can be really elusive, so there's no one-size-fits-all solution as far as a tactic of what sample to use, what microphone to use, where to place it. But there are bigger overarching principles, and then there's a lot of hard work underneath. That's what makes it frustrating. People want to rush through the recording process to get to mixing because A, mixing is more fun, B, there's a lot more mixing tips out there. C, it's frustrating and difficult to get it right at the source. So a lot of people just don't want to sit in that difficulty. They rush through it. They do a bad job. They move on to mixing, not realizing that they've shot themselves in the foot by recording something that just doesn't sound very good. For these four tips, I'm going to start with the easiest one to implement and work my way to number four, which is the most difficult but also the most rewarding. Tip number one, make your panning decisions during the recording phase. That may seem backwards because panning is clearly a mixing thing that we do, but for me... I find myself making way better music when I make those panning decisions early when I record the track. So if I'm sitting down to record something, I'll record, let's say, a guitar track. And then I'll listen to it and say, all right, where does this belong? Left, center, or right? Those are my three buckets. Once I decide, I move on. So if I decide that this guitar doesn't really need to be up the middle, it's not like front and center, I'll put it in, let's say, the left bucket. If I put it in the left bucket, the next thing that I do is find something to go into the right bucket to balance against that guitar. That might be another guitar part, it might be a keyboard part, might be anything, uh, but I do that in the recording process because I've had many productions in the past where I've recorded a bunch of tracks and not really made the panning decisions. And then when it comes time to mix, I end up with like a track or two that don't have a partner and they don't really belong up the middle or the left or the right. They're kind of orphans in a way. I don't like that because then I have to end up either going back and recording something else to pair with it, which is no fun, or I have to just have something feel lopsided, or I drop that really cool track right in the middle and it's kind of getting drowned out by everything else happening up the middle. That's why I like to make the recording decisions or the panning decisions during the recording phase. My mixes turn out a lot better because of it, and just the raw tracks when I listen back during a recording session sound great because I'm making those big, huge panning decisions right at the source. This panning concept is a part of my ultimate recording checklist. It's a one-page checklist that you can use as a reference just to give you some creative ideas on your next recording session. It's absolutely free. Just go to homestudiocorner.com slash checklist to download your copy. Tip number two, leave the faders at zero. There is nothing like pulling in a bunch of tracks into a mix session and pressing play and it already sounds pretty stinking mixed. That happens when you don't record everything as hot as possible and then turn it way down at the fader. I talked about this in a video about clipping, but the, the idea here is if I'm going to record, let's say, a shaker track, there's really no need for that shaker track to be super loud. In fact, that's one of the biggest critiques I have when people send me mixes. For some reason, people make their shakers way too loud. It could be that you're older and you've lost a lot of high frequencies in your hearing, so you're cranking that shaker so you can hear it, but the rest of us who can hear those frequencies, are our ears are bleeding because there's too much shaker there, so ease up on the shakers. But if I'm recording a shaker, and let's say the meter goes like this, here's way down, quiet, here's clipping, a lot of people want to record their shakers right up here, that perfect spot just below clipping. Well, what happens? You open up the mix and you press play and the shaker cuts your face off, so you have to turn it way down. Why not turn it down at the source? Hmm? Why not just record it quieter, turn the preamp down, so that the shaker feels right when all the faders are at zero? I heard this from my buddy Al Wagner years ago, and while it's not a rule in the sense of it, it makes the recordings themselves sound better, it does help things in the mix when you just pull up the tracks, have all the faders at zero, and things are already sounding fairly balanced. You can do that by adjusting the balance with your preamp, 
when you're recording rather than recording everything as loud as possible and then having to turn it all down to get it to sit nicely in the mix. It's almost like a game, and what ends up happening is the tracks come together much more easily. Instead of recording a bunch of stuff and then I've got clipping and now I've got to turn things down and adjust, I'm not worried about any of that stuff because I'm recording at such a conservative level where things sound great with the faders at zero. So when I sit down to mix, I'm truly coming into something that's already in a lot of ways halfway mixed because of the way that I recorded it. Number three has to do with using the solo button. When I talk about get it right at the source, I'm not talking about get it perfect at the source. While in a sense, perfection might be the standard, like the perfect storm would be, I record all the tracks and there's nothing to do in the mix. That's never ever gonna happen because tracks will need things like EQ, compression effects, things like that. That's okay. I'm not saying we shouldn't have to do anything during mixing, but we shouldn't have to do a whole lot of heavy lifting to fix a lot of broken stuff in mixing. If you can crack that code, your mixes sound way better because you spend your time enhancing something great versus fixing something broken. So when I talk about solo versus listening in context, I mean listening to something with the solo button pressed by itself, just the raw recording, versus listening to it in context of everything else that you've recorded, I think both are important, especially in the recording phase. However, I'm not looking for perfection. So I might solo something just to hear to make sure there aren't any glaring errors, for example. I recorded drums several years ago, and I had a compressor set up over here on the snare drum, and it was a hectic day. I was stressed out, and I hit record. All the levels looked good, so we just ran with it and recorded four songs, five songs that day. When the musicians went home, I went back to listen to the tracks and soloed each one, and I heard that the snare drum was terrible. I had set the compressor all wrong. It was like super fast attack, way too much compression. Instead of sounding like a snare drum, it sounded like... It was really bad. Um, my mistake. I have to live with that. But one of the things that would have solved that is if I took just an extra moment to listen to everything in solo before saying, okay, let's start recording all the songs. Does that make sense? I, I rushed through the process. I only listened to the snare drum in context of all the tracks, and I missed that big mistake. How could you miss that? I don't know. Probably because I had nice like overhead and room sound, room mics and overhead. So the sound of the overall kit sounded pretty cool, but that individual snare drum was messed up and I didn't catch it because I didn't solo things. I don't solo things much in my music making process, whether I'm recording or mixing, but in this early phase when you're getting sounds and recording that specific track, it makes sense to at least give it a listen in solo to make sure there aren't any surprises. But on the flip side of that, what matters most is how it sounds against everything else. So if you record a guitar part that's super thin and by itself it sounds wimpy and wispy and like it doesn't have any life or any like energy to it, but then you drop it in with all the other parts that you've recorded and it sits perfectly on top of everything else. Again, talking about just the raw tracks themselves, that's wonderful. That's great. But if you find that something is really thin and it doesn't sound good in the context of everything else and you're thinking, well, I'll just fix it with some EQ later, that's the thing I want to stop you from doing. Instead of saying, I'll fix it later with plugins, say, how can I fix it now with changing something in my setup? Number four, and this is the big one, the infinite feedback loop. What is a feedback loop? If I'm playing guitar and it starts to squeal, or I'm talking into a microphone and it starts to shriek, what's happening? The signal is feeding back into itself and it causes this ringing that's terrible. That's bad, or maybe awesome if you're playing electric guitar, but what does that look like in a recording studio? We're not talking about that squealy feedback. I'm talking about letting your recording tell you where it wants to go. And we do that by following a simple three-step loop that goes around and around. So it starts with just recording something. So if I'm recording guitar, for example, acoustic guitar, I'll set up the mic and I'll record not the entire song, just a snippet, the intro or the chorus, something fairly short. After I've recorded it, I stop, take off my headphones, put the instrument down, mute the microphone, and I listen to what I recorded on my speakers. If it sounds good, we're good to go. We don't even have to go through the feedback loop. But more often than not, when I listen, which is the second stop in this loop, record, listen, I usually hear something that I don't like. There's something that could be adjusted. And that's the third part of the loop. Record, listen, adjust. I adjust something that I'm doing to improve on the sound that I just recorded. After making that adjustment, we're back at the top. We're doing it again. And you may go through this phase just once or twice, occasionally nunts, 
nuts isn't a word, uh, or maybe you'll go through it five, six, seven, eight times. It is work. I mentioned at the beginning, this is the phase that will make the biggest impact on your music, but this is the one that the most that most people will ignore because they don't want to put in the work. If I sit down and I go through all the trouble of setting everything up, got my headphones on, got my microphone, got my level set, I can hear it in my headphones, it sounds fine to me, let's just record already. I understand it, I've done that before, and it's been a mistake. Because when you're playing something and listening on headphones, you can't truly hear what it sounds like. Because I've got the, the guitar reverberating through my body, I'm hearing it bleeding into the headphones a little bit, I'm also hearing what it sounds like on the microphone, but all that other stuff happening is preventing me from hearing it clearly. Also, headphones typically aren't going to have as clear of a picture as studio monitors, for example. So it, even though it's annoying, it's worth it to take the headphones off, mute the microphone, unmute the speakers, and listen back to what you just recorded. Is it frustrating? Yeah. Is it time-consuming? Sure. Is it worth it? 100%. So record, listen, then adjust. Now, the big question is, well, what, what do you mean by adjust? What do I adjust? Really anything. It's a lot like a science experiment. Or if you've got a mysterious noise in your system, what do you do about it? Well, you eliminate potential causes. You simplify the system. You change something. You test things one component at a time. It's a similar process to recording. So if I don't like the way this guitar is sounding, I've got lots of options to adjust. So if I have another guitar, the answer might be a different instrument. The answer might be a different microphone. The answer a lot of times is just a different position of the microphone. Move the microphone somewhere else. A movement of just a few inches can have a huge difference in the way it sounds when it's recorded. Um, it could be if it's a virtual instrument, it could be pick a different virtual instrument. If it's a drum sample pack, it could be choose a different sample for that kick drum, for that snare drum. Um, it, it could be anything. It could be a different cable even. I don't know. But the, the key here is that you're adjusting something based on what you heard. And when you do that, the ultimate goal is for this to sound amazing in the tracks with everything else. If this is the very first track that you record, then you want it to sound amazing by itself. As you're adding more things, you want them to sound amazing along with everything else in its raw recorded form before you do any mixing. Does that sound a little bit daunting? Yes. Does it sound difficult? Yeah, it is difficult. It's frustrating. I've been doing this for a real long time, and I can think of a session recently where I'm sitting here, I'm recording something, and it's just not working in the mix. And there's even now, even though I'm the Mr. Get It Right, the Source guy, I still say to myself, I could probably just fix that with EQ later. And then I say, no. No, Joe, you're not going to fix it later. You're going to figure this thing out. And I grab a different guitar or I put a capo on or I do something, move the microphone to figure out where it's going to go. And that applies to everything. If it's an electric guitar, it might mean changing out the amp or the pedal or one of the effects pedals that I'm using. There are so many things that you can change. I can't give you a formula of what needs to change, but make note of what you don't like about it and then figure out something to change that might fix that problem. You might get it wrong. You may go through the second round of that loop and it sounds worse than the first. All right, you learn something, go back to the first setup and then listen again and then make a change. The goal here is to f make it sound as good as possible. Not perfect, it'll never be perfect, but as good as possible. And a lot of times you're not gonna nail it on the first try and that's okay, that's normal. Professionals don't nail it on the first try, so why would you expect to? Give yourself at least one good round through that feedback loop just once every time you record something and it'll transform everything you're doing in the studio. Here's a final piece of advice for you. If you're serious about getting better at recording and you really want to dive into this, YouTube is a great place to get information, but it's pretty random and it's fairly unstructured. If you're looking for a more structured way to really start to take huge steps when it comes to your recordings, which will transform your mixes and your masters and your releases, I highly encourage you to check out my recording course. It is not free. It costs money, but... I have found that people who pay for things like courses tend to get way better results than people who only consume free content. Is that biased? Absolutely it is. But I firmly believe that this recording course will be one of the best purchases you ever make, ever make for your studio. And it doesn't cost nearly as much as whatever the last instrument that you bought costs. So it's worth at least checking out to see if it makes sense for you. So go to homestudiocorner.com slash record to check it out. Hey, thanks for watching. If you're not a subscriber already, please subscribe. And if you want to learn another recording tip from me, specifically about how to record vocals and takes and all of that stuff, check out this video.